Welcome to Food for Thought, the place to explore, celebrate, and manifest a life motivated and defined by unconditional compassion and optimal wellness. Today's episode is Vegan Food is for the Wealthy, for the Rich, for the Privileged, for the Elite. Before we tackle that topic, my name is Colleen Patrick Gaudreau. You can find me at joyfulvegan.com. You can find me on social media. You can find my books wherever books are sold, and you can join me in my online cooking classes or on my vegan trips around the world. Just go to joyfulvegan.com. As always, this podcast is listener supported. So if it's something you value and you'd like to enjoy some perks by supporting, just head over to patreon.com slash Colleen Patrick Gaudreau to become a supporter today at your chosen level. And if you'd like to experience the best of vegan travel, I am thrilled to announce that our Rwanda November 2022 trip is now 100% happening. We reached the minimum number of people to run the trip, so we are running the trip, but we do have some rooms left. Same thing with our Tuscany June 2022 trip. We are going back to Tuscany, and we've just reached the minimum number to go and we would love you to join us. We have a few rooms left for that one as well. Our Northern Italy June 2022 trip has sold out, but get on the wait list for any trips that are sold out because A, you never know if someone's going to cancel, and B, you will get first dibs if and when we run that trip again. And considering the popularity of especially the Italy trips, the Northern Italy trip sold out very quickly. We may do so again in 2023. So don't think you shouldn't go over there and check out the details or put your name on the list, even though it's sold out. Everything you need is over at joyfulvegantrips.com. Joyful Vegan Trips, travel with purpose. That's what they are. And I'm thrilled to have you join us. Hi, everybody. I hope you are doing fabulously well. I have talked about this topic in various places, articles, videos, my books, the 30-Day Vegan Challenge, and even in previous podcast episodes here on Food for Thought. But the last time I did was in 2007 and 2009. Yes, the podcast has been going on that long. (laughs) Uh, So I thought it would be good to revisit it here in 2022 because it comes up again and again and again, and it's worth addressing. There are many variations on this theme I've heard a lot of different variations on this theme. But the charge basically goes something like this. A vegan diet is accessible only to the privileged, wealthy, elite who have enough money, who have enough affluence to buy organic produce and expensive vegan products. Vegan food is more expensive, that sort of thing. Now, this opens a huge can of beans uh, because there's a lot tied up in that short little paragraph. And I'm going to unpack it with you today here on Food for Thought. Now, this is a huge generalization, right? It's often just, it's just so huge. I mean, just saying vegan food is huge, right? Because there's so much to say just about that phrase. And it's often said as a quick way to just kind of write the whole thing off, to delegitimize, to discredit veganism, and certainly as an excuse to not make any changes at all personally. So it's not that this issue of you know food economics and you know, poverty and hunger and, and socioeconomic status and food accessibility and all of these things, it's not that these aren't important issues. It's that that's not really what we're talking about here when we're talking about the assertion that, quote unquote, vegan food is more expensive. It's become a bit of a red herring and a way to derail the topics we need to be looking at that would actually solve the problems we all care about, problems that are related to hunger and poverty and socioeconomic status and food accessibility, etc., And so let's dive into this. First of all, it needs to be said that vegan food is a ridiculously huge category and different people think of different aspects of it when they say vegan food. So in order to address this assertion, this accusation, this charge that vegan food is expensive and only for the rich, let's revisit my definition of vegan food, which is fruits and vegetables and nuts and seeds and beans and grains and mushrooms and lentils and herbs and spices. It's plants. It's food we all eat on a daily basis though we should all be eating more of, uh, though we might not call it vegan. So just taking, you know, kind of all of that outside of this box called vegan food, it's a lot more familiar and it's a lot easier to see how large a generalization this is 
and how inaccurate it actually is. And I hope to demonstrate that. So when we're talking about these plant foods, these vegetables and grains, especially lentils, beans, when we talk about these plant foods, these plant foods have been the staple of the masses, mostly the poor masses for centuries all around the world. And meat, dairy, and eggs have been products of privilege and symbols of affluence, affordable only by the wealthy and denied to the poor, period, full stop. So the idea that we've twisted this around and we've created this narrative that it's plant foods that are actually <laughs> affordable only to the wealthy and denied to the poor, it's it's quite remarkable and it's absolutely not true. Now, from a health perspective, ultimately, the idea that the majority of people ate plant foods uh, over the centuries before the industrialization of food has proven to be a good thing. Because if you look at less affluent countries, and you can do this historically, you can do this now, looking at less, less affluent countries where industrialization has not yet taken hold, animal flesh in particular tends to be served in very small portions or eaten only on special occasions. And because they're eating predominantly animal-free, they center their diet on vegetables and grains and root vegetables and legumes typically, uh, and fruits as well, uh, the types of which vary depending on the regions in which they lived. As a result, in which they live, as a result, their diets are often healthier and more sustainable than the diets of their more wealthy counterparts. In other words, they don't have rampant cases of what we call diseases of affluence. Diseases of affluence, this is a name given to the diseases that are caused by the consumption of high amounts of animal products in affluent locales, countries, places, etc. So there's a name for this. It's called diseases of affluence. They've been called diseases of rich people or diseases of civilization. That was a term uh, coined uh, by French physician Stanislas Tanshu in 1843 when he was looking at death registries and he concluded that cancer was more common in cities than it was in rural areas and that the incidence of cancer was increasing. So whatever you call it, diseases of affluence, these diseases of civilization refer to the fact that as wealth increases, so does the consumption of animal products, so does the prevalence of the associated diseases. Now, these diseases of affluence or diseases of civilization, these are non-communicable, non-infectious diseases. They're atherosclerosis, the hardening of the arteries, they're asthma, cancer, uh, cirrhosis of the liver, uh, chronic liver disease, type 2 diabetes, gout, hypertension, which is high blood pressure, uh, chronic renal failure, osteoporosis, stroke, depression, diverticulitis, gallstones, all of these are associated with the consumption of animal products, and all of them are prevalent in affluent areas. Now, that doesn't mean they're only prevalent in affluent areas, and I'll talk about that, but that's the correlation that we can see. Obesity is often included in the list of these diseases of civilization. Personally, I think it's more accurate to talk about obesity as a risk factor for other diseases rather than a disease in and of itself. Now, in contrast, you have the diseases of poverty, and these tend to be largely infectious diseases. They're also called contagious diseases or communicable diseases, and they're the result of poor living conditions, uh, those that come about because of the presence of microorganisms such as viruses, bacteria, fungi, uh, protozoa, uh, and prions, like you would see from mad cow disease, uh, bovine spongiform encephalopathy. Now, these infectious diseases uh, can be spread uh, directly or indirectly from one person to another, uh, as you well know, too well now. Uh, and they include these infectious diseases, HIV, uh, tuberculosis, uh, which is was called um, consumption at one time, uh, measles, whooping cough, tetanus, meningitis, syphilis, hepatitis B, herpes, malaria, mumps, influenza, uh, chicken pox, ringworm, and let's include coronaviruses such as COVID-19. And as you would have heard me talk about in previous episodes, most of these are also zoonotic diseases in that humans contracted them because of our contact with or consumption of other animals. Now, let me put this in perspective for you. In 1900, pneumonia, 
uh, influenza, tuberculosis, uh, and uh, diarrhea were the top three causes of death in the United States, with 60% of all deaths attributed to infectious diseases. And heart disease was the fourth leading cause of death. Today, it's number one in both men and women. There's a lot of reasons for this. I talk about this in an episode that's specifically talking about diseases of civilization, of course, sanitation and vaccines and medication, uh, the development of modern medical system. Those are all the things that have contributed to improvement in terms of infectious diseases. But now here we are dying from preventable, non-communicable diseases. So now, as I said, heart disease is the number one killer in the United States. In Canada, it's the second leading cause of death. In Australia, it's the leading cause of death. And in the United Kingdom, it causes one in four premature deaths. Worldwide, 17 million people die around the world um, from heart disease. In 1900, today, in 1900, diabetes was 27th. Cancer was way down in eighth position. By 1950, cancer had become the third leading cause of death, and today it's the leading cause of death in both men and women. From the 1940s to the late 1990s, heart disease, cancer, uh, degenerative diseases, the ones we named, diabetes, cirrhosis, kidney failure, um, these all accounted for the maximum number of deaths. That's what we're dying from now, and these are preventable diseases. Now, it's not to say that people of lower socioeconomic status don't get these diseases of affluence. Of course they do. And that's because animal-based flesh and fluids are kept so artificially cheap due to the mechanized factory system, the industrialization of our food system that treats animals as so many outputs and inputs, and because of government subsidies, that the poor and everyone else can afford to eat every day what are, in fact, very expensive things to produce. So at one time, only the rich really could afford them because they were only paying the true cost of, of, of that food. Um, but now, because of uh, industrialization, everyone is eating what is pretty much cheap food at this point, but very expensive to produce. In other words, everyone, wherever they are on the economic ladder, everyone's eating the fatty, rich animal products that were once only reserved for the rich. But the diseases associated with these products, still called diseases of affluence, afflict those with and without affluence. The diseases have no prejudice and no concern for class or economic status or race. The truth is when people make the transition away from animal products, away from these very rich foods, because there's so much fat in them, so double entendre there, <laughs> but also foods that really are in reality very expensive to produce and have very high costs, and we'll talk about that, especially if they're consuming more whole vegetables and whole fruits and whole grains, one of the things they tend to notice is how much less money they spend on food. Now, this is where we need to make a distinction between those whole plant foods I mentioned, the vegan foods that people say, which is fruits and vegetables and nuts and seeds and beans and mushrooms and grains and, and lentils and herbs and spices, and convenience foods. Even with all of the government subsidies, animal proteins are still still more expensive than whole plant proteins, okay? So the subsidies make them cheap and the buybacks make them cheap, the government buybacks, and yet still they're typically more expensive than whole plant proteins. And as for convenience foods, the packaged, pre-made, just heat it up when you get home foods or take it out of the freezer foods, they simply cost more than whole foods whether they're plant-based or not, convenience foods are more expensive by definition than whole foods or even than, you know, animal meat um, because you're choosing to pay in money rather than in time, right? So that's what convenience foods are. You're saying, I'm going to pay a little bit more for this 
uh, so that I don't have to pay in my time, right? And so in order to make the most affordable choices and the most healthful choices, of course, make whole plant foods the foundation of your diet. It's never, you're never going to beat the cost, the low cost of whole plant foods. But luckily, our choices are not limited to cheap animal-based hot dogs or expensive veggie hot dogs, right? Uh, they're also not limited to only whole plant foods versus only convenience foods. These are both false dichotomies. Unless you're following a strict whole foods uh, and or raw diet where you're eating only whole foods, no packaged foods at all. And I, some people do this. I, they're a small minority. But unless you're doing that, most of us eat a combination of whole foods, prepared foods, convenience foods, highly processed foods, less processed foods, restaurant foods, etc. And it's up to each one of us which ones we favor over others at any given time, right? Each and every day, we can make choices that are more expensive and those that are more affordable and those that are cheaper. And some of it has to do with paying in time versus paying in money. And that doesn't mean it has to be the same thing every single day. Now, I also have to make a distinction between eating affordably and eating cheaply because there is a difference. Most Americans and I can only speak for Americans because it's where my you know, field of expertise lies, but I think this is the case happening more and more around the world. I think we, I could probably even make a generalization and say Westerners are eating cheap food, right? Made artificially cheap due to government sus subsidies and buybacks for meat, dairy, and eggs. The problem isn't that healthful whole plant foods are expensive. The problem is that animal products are priced so artificially low, even though they're very expensive to produce. And so the problem is that people see a the a, a, you know vegetables or something you're paying the, the true cost for versus a subsidized egg and they somehow draw the conclusion that the vegetable or the plant food is more expensive when I'm going to demonstrate actually that that's not even true. People though would eat a lot less animal flesh and fluids if they had to pay the true cost. It's just the reality. And while I realize that the externalities aren't considered when we're making food choices that are out of habit or part of our culture or from a you know, socioeconomic status or out of convenience or hunger or time constraints, the truth is there are externalities that we all pay for and we have to talk about them because the cheap food that the majority of people are eating has huge costs beyond dollars, right? So I'm going to talk about dollars and we're going we're gonna to do a cost comparison, but we have to talk about the cost to our health. We talked about it a little bit in terms of the diseases of affluence and civilization. Um, there's cost to the earth. There's cost to the people who produce the food. There's cost to the animals. And there's cost to our own mental health and our own spirits when we're not living according to the things we really do care about and when we're consuming such high amounts of Mm, products of violence. And that's just what it is. We can't escape from that. And there are also many ways. The good news is that there are many ways to reduce these costs to the benefit of everyone involved, if you're willing to make some changes. Now, if you're listening to this episode, perhaps you are willing to make some changes. Perhaps you're participating in Veganuary. Perhaps you've made a New Year's resolution to reduce or eliminate meat. Perhaps you've decided to take my 30-day vegan challenge, the first and original vegan challenge, I will say. I will have you know. Um, you can take it as an online program at 30dayveganchallenge.com or you can buy the book uh, to use as your guide. But if you're looking to make a change, first of all, good for you. Most people say they want to make a difference, but they forget that in order to make a difference, you may have to do something different. So the fact that you're willing to do something different is really the first step. And so whatever changes you're making... First of all, please let me know if there's anything I can do to help you transition. I hope you listen to different episodes on this podcast. It's been it's in its 16th year, and so there's lots there for you uh, to help you uh, transition, at least to eat less of, ideally to eat none of those substances that create the most amount of havoc in our bodies, on the planet, for the animals, etc. And if you're worried about cost, just hear me out. When people make the transition to a plant-based diet, one of the things they notice is how much less money they spend on food. I've seen it again and again. I've been doing this work for 22 years. Okay, it's anecdotal that I'm telling you this, 
because I don't, I didn't, I didn't document every single person who told this to me, but there are plenty of studies that indicate this as well. However, I have seen it time and again. But before you can determine how much you might save, you have to know how much you're currently spending. So wherever you are in your journey, I really encourage you to keep a journal for a week documenting what you eat and how much you spend, especially if you're still eating animal products here and now. You can do this exercise even if you're already vegan and want to eat more whole foods, wherever you are in your journey, whatever you're doing, however you're eating, whatever. Just this is a really helpful exercise. It's a helpful exercise to give you a good sense of how much you spend, but also of how much you eat, of how much you eat of meat, dairy, and eggs. Most people say, I don't eat a lot of meat, dairy, and eggs. But the truth is, you don't know how much you eat until you stop. You don't know how much you do of anything until you actually stop. So once you have this log, you can then compare your spending habits uh, during this transition or as a vegan, or if you're eating more, trying to eat more whole foods, whatever, whatever changes you're looking to make, you will be able to compare. Now, unless you're relying solely on packaged, pre-made convenience foods, I would wager that your grocery bill will decrease. I mean, I mean you might be eating out every single meal, but I, I, I doubt it. I would wager that your grocery bill will go down, especially if you're incorporating more whole fruits and vegetables and grains into your diet. So let's look at a cost comparison. Let's look at a cost comparison. Even with the government subsidies that meat, dairy, and eggs enjoy, as I said, animal proteins are still more expensive than pr plant proteins. And since people still obsess over protein, this one single nutrient, let's look at the highest protein plant foods and compare them to protein from animal flesh, right? This is a really helpful guide. And I'm really grateful to Diane Vukovic from plenteousveg.com. She did this cost comparison, which I think is super, super helpful. And I'll have the link on the website for you to go see because I'm just going to go over a few, but there's even more on, on her blog. So I'm going to do organic quinoa. It's going to be less if you don't do organic. This is actually organic quinoa that she said was uh, priced at Walmart. So this isn't, you know, at some fancy schmancy store. Quinoa that's not organic would be less, but but even organic quinoa at Walmart at Walmart was 7.4 cents per gram of protein, okay? So by pound, it's $4.78, but by gram, per gram, it's 7 cents. Now let's look at tofu. Uh, tofu is 6 cents per gram, 6.2 cents per gram of protein, and about $2.50 a pound, and one pound is 40 grams of protein. Now, it would be even less if you're making it from scratch, which I've been doing, and you can go get the on-demand class, the recipe, the video, everything from my homemade tofu class, which I highly recommend. And also if you're making your soy milk from scratch, and you'll see the whole process of the soy milk and the tofu all at once in that video. But even if you're buying it packaged in the store, six cents per gram of protein. Okay, six cents, pretty good. Peanut butter, 2.4 cents per gram of protein, $2.70 per pound. One ounce is seven grams of protein. So you get a lot of bang for your buck in peanut butter. Brown rice, 1.9 cents. So not even two cents per gram of protein, 78 cents per pound. And uh, one pound, uh, one cup actually, one pound equals eight cups, one cup is five grams of protein. Lentils, 1.6 cents per gram, right? And lentils, are, we know, are very high in protein. One cup cooked uh, lentils, 18 grams of protein. So that's one cup. Uh, is 18 grams. And that's not unreasonable to eat a cup of lentils in a sitting. So that's 18 grams right there. And it's 1.6 cents per gram. So you do the math. It's very easy. Um, <laughs> dry beans, even better. Dried beans are about a dollar a pound for dry beans, uh, one cent per gram of protein. And there are 15 grams of protein in one cup of cooked beans. So that's pretty good. Chickpeas, she breaks it down even more. Uh, rolled oats, another high protein plant food, 0.7 cents per gram of protein. So a dollar a pound, about a dollar a pound. And if you look at the grams of protein, it's 26 grams of protein for one cup of dry 
oats. So not bad in all these ways. And to put this in perspective, so let me just, I'll just recap this. So we're talking 0.7 cents uh, a gram um, per gram uh, in oats, one cent, one cent, 1.6 cents, 1.9 cents, 2.4 cents, and and 7.4 cents in in the uh, in the quinoa example, when we're looking at animal protein, we've got four and a half cents for steak, four cents for ground beef, two point seven cents for cow's milk, two point six cents for ham, two point five cents for eggs. Now, in all these cases, you're still getting lower in all of the plant foods that I gave you, and there's not all of the other externalities. Chicken, unfortunately, chickens because. We kill so many, we kill over 9 billion a year in the United States. And because subsidies for their feed and for their flesh are so high to make buying them so cheap, sadly, chickens is 1.5 cents per gram of protein, still higher than beans or, or lentils, uh, or what else? I think it was, uh, yeah, chickpeas, beans, lentils, uh, brown rice is 1.9 uh, so there you go. So again, no, no ex externalized cost. Now, if you price out vegan meats, such as veggie dogs and all of the wonderful meats that, that are out there today, they're going to cost around four to $5 a pound. So a little bit more, but so would convenience foods like the, the you know, lots of convenience foods that are not vegan are going to cost more. And you know, A, you're going to also have fewer externalities because you're not going to have the environmental effects. You're not going to have the health effects of the plant-based burgers, etc. And this is another reason, B, it's another reason I emphasize basing your diet on whole foods. So if you want to indulge in these convenience foods, it's fine. But just remember that when you buy non-vegan convenience foods, you're also paying more than if you're buying whole foods, right? So what happens when people just make this generalization that vegan food is more expensive is that you're often comparing apples to oranges, no pun intended. Ultimately, in terms of the most healthful and the most affordable food, whole foods, whole plant foods win every time. Over processed foods and over animal flesh and fluids. Now, I want to make a note about processed foods. I have podcast episodes on this. I am someone who is not opposed to what tends to be just called, again, just kind of this blanket term, processed foods. I prefer to talk about a spectrum of you know, least processed foods to highly processed foods. And that's the case if you even look at peanut butter. So I use the example of peanut butter. That's a processed food, right? It's less processed than, say, texturized vegetable protein, TVP, but it's, but it's still a processed food. The point is there's a spectrum, and I'm not someone who's just against like any kind of processed food. My argument is the main problem I have with them, and I don't have a problem with them. It's not a, it's not a crusade that I'm on at all. Um, but what I would say is, you know, if you're considering them, and if you want to compare this kind of more fairly, um, a, the processed, you know, highly processed foods or convenience foods are A, more expensive uh, than whole foods. B, they come with packaging that are going to wind up in a landfill. So that's one of the reasons that I don't buy them. And C, uh, they're just not as nutrient dense as whole foods. So in other words, there's nothing wrong with eating minimally processed foods or highly processed foods per se, other than they displace more healthful, more affordable whole foods. Does that make sense? So that's my consideration, just, just something to consider. So it's not that you can't ever enjoy, you know, highly processed foods or however you want, but as we incorporate more whole foods and even if we just, you know, switch the balance a bit so that we're eating more whole foods relative to the more processed foods or convenience foods, I think right now it's just flipped the other way around. And I think the majority of people are eating mostly processed foods, mostly highly processed foods and mostly convenience foods and fast food. And we'll talk about that in another episode. So aside from changing our buying habits, we need to change our thinking when it comes to the money we spend on what we eat. Traditionally, people have praised cheap animal products that allow more people to buy what are, in fact, as I've argued, very expensive things to produce. But they are ignoring the full costs beyond the actual dollars we spend, the cost to our health, the cost to the planet, the cost to the people who produce the food, the cost to the animals, etc. Now you look at like 
pig production, pork production, the people who live in North Carolina, the heart of the pig meat industry, they have a lot to say about the high cost, environmental cost, of cheap hot dogs and ham slices and bacon strips. 10 million pigs are confined in North Carolina hog farms, and there are serious public health and environmental concerns, not to mention the concerns about the animals. One of the biggest problems stems from the fact that pigs excrete four times as much waste as humans do. And that waste pours into open air waste lagoons. Where do you think this goes? It just goes into these lagoons that are often as big as several football fields. And these lagoons are prone to leaks and spills. And there have been several instances of lagoons bursting and spilling millions of gallons of pig waste into nearby rivers, killing fish, destroying wetlands, contaminating water supplies, sickening people, and destroying anything that lives. The animal waste consumes the oxygen in the water when it gets into rivers and destroys everything and everyone in that water. Where there's no oxygen, there's no life. Hence, in the Gulf of Mexico, there is what is called the dead zone. Just type in dead zone in the Gulf of Mexico. You will see it. It is horrific. And the size fluctuates every year, but it's about 7,000 to 8,000 square miles large. Okay, so that's just one example. There are many, many, many examples of the environmental effects of animal production. Anyone who claims that those cheap animal products are good for the consumer hasn't considered another way we pay for them, and that's the healthcare costs, which are much lower for vegans than they are for non-vegans and non-vegetarians. Vegans have less chronic disease, better heart health, and a lower risk of certain cancers. And in fact, health insurance agencies are promoting lifestyle changes to try to offset the costs associated with heart disease. There's still no discounts available for those who follow a vegan diet. I am optimistic. This is on the horizon. You heard it here first. You probably heard it somewhere else first. But it, I'm certain that's going to happen. Because when you look at the cost of coronary bypass surgery, stents, cholesterol-lowering drugs, diabetes drugs, dialysis, all of these correlated with animal-based diets, they're incredibly expensive. And insurance companies don't want to pay them anymore. And... And all of this pain and misery and expense and death, they could be pre prevented. What's more, how many people undergoing these expensive treatments have no insurance at all? How many of them are the working poor or the elderly? How many of them are not told by their physicians that they have options other than getting their chest cut open and going through, uh, you know, bypass surgery only to have a temporary Band-Aid applied? In the vast majority of cases, by the way, an unhealthy cardiovascular system is the result of lifestyle, namely poor diet. We know this. There is study after study after study after study that indicate this, that prove this, peer-reviewed studies published in reputable journals. We know this. We know this. Every time we don't choose a healthful plant food, we're making a decision about how we want to feel in the short term as well as in the long term. And we're making decisions for our children as well. I have always been really interested in the research that indicates that the food habits instilled in us as children dictate how we eat as adults. I think that's really fascinating. I am someone who advocates for behavioral changes, and that's why I have the 30-Day Vegan Challenge and do the work that I do, so I know it's possible in adults. But research indicates that the food choices we make as children, they're strong predictors of disease later in life, and it's harder to make ch changes. It's harder to change your habit when you're an adult. It just is. So in other words, what children eat during their formative years has a profound impact on their future health and future habits. And since American children eat so few whole plant foods, there is much room for improvement. That's the good news, right? So those are the health costs, some environmental costs, there's the monetary costs, as we talked about. And, you know, I grew up the daughter of parents who lived through the depression. My father was born in 1932. He just turned 90 years old. And I remember the stories he told me about living through the depression. And they had very little money. They literally counted every 
penny. He tells me how exciting it was for him and his brother and sister when they had just enough money to go buy a half a loaf of bread for dinner um, or a lollipop for each of them as a treat. Now, I'm not romanticizing the difficulties he and his family experienced, and I'm certainly not trivial trivializing them. It was a very, very difficult time. But I really appreciate the simplicity of how they lived and really the gratitude they felt when they were able to afford something extravagant like a lollipop. We all know how much we appreciate something we have to fight for. And in our days of plenty, we don't have to fight for much. And so I think we appreciate less. And so I make an effort in my life to just appreciate more. My father grew up during the Depression. My parents did not have a lot of money when I was growing up. My parents divorced. My mother was a single um, working mom. She had two jobs. And I remember her pinching pennies a lot. Now, I was a teenager and I didn't appreciate very much what she had to endure. But now as an adult, I do much more. And I make an effort to just appreciate what we have, to save for what we want and for what we need. I, I am someone who lives by a budget um, because I just don't believe in paying for things you don't have. Uh, I use up what we have in our cupboards before we go shopping and I do my best to choose healthful whole foods rather than expensive packaged products and I love cooking simple meals. I just really appreciate it. Now, I didn't grow up eating that. I grew up eating fast food and, and you know, uh, meat. And again, because it was cheap, even though we didn't have a lot of money. But I I certainly grew up, grew up not eating, you know, the, the, you know, the whole, I didn't grow up eating kale, but like we, you know, we were buying animal products. And now I'm buying what really are less expensive products, and I could afford them more than I could when, you know, when I was growing up. So, so there are ways to make decisions about, again, kind of like how we want to live and where we want to spend our money and where we want to spend our time. And there are ways to make choices around simplicity. Does it have to be every single solitary meal? No. Does it have to be every single day? No. Does it doesn't have to be about deprivation, but there are ways we can simplify things and certainly spend a little bit more time when we're able rather than spend more money. And the best way to do this in terms of affordability is eating at home. Now, I am going to talk about eating out in another episode, and I'm going to talk about fast food, because this is a reality for many millions of people and many millions of families who actually rely on the cheap food that fast food affords them. We're going to talk about that in a different episode. But let's talk about eating at home and cooking at home, which is really one of the best uh, and easiest ways to eat affordably and certainly to eat healthfully. Uh, we spend almost half of our food budget eating out, all of us in the United States, in the UK, and it takes a toll on our wallets, it takes a toll on our bodies, and it takes a toll on our taste buds. Restaurant chefs, and we're not talking about fast food restaurants here, just fast, just restaurants, restaurant chefs are trained to maximize the use of fat and salt. So the calorie dense dishes in restaurants not only contribute to weight gain and health problems, but also to our palates lacking sensitivity because they're so coated with fat and sodium. So eating out can definitely be part of it. I, we, we eat out, <laughs> right? We eat out at you know, and we obviously order the plant-based dishes or go to a vegan rest go to vegan restaurants. But of course, eating out is can be part of your life. It's a wonderful, enjoyable experience when we can do it safely and when we can do it when this pandemic just at least calms down, uh, right? But that's not to say that you can never eat out. But if you want to eat more affordably, then eating at home more often than you eat out is going to be the thing to do. And I personally, uh, because I work from home, I have always eaten, obviously, lunch at home. But I know, you know, again, this is, it's hard to talk without acknowledging the pandemic we're all still in because, you know, lunchtime meetings were a thing and people who traveled for work was, was a thing more prevalent before the pandemic. But, you know, when we're able to... I just recommend that we choose home-cooked meals over restaurant fare. Of course, you can bring food with you also to your office, but you know, I realize it's not possible all the time, right? But you know, I do encourage you to at least, if you're working out of the off home and you're working in the office now, to at least strive to eat breakfast at home and dinner at home. Maybe lunch can be something that you eat. You're just like, I have to eat it out 
because of the work I do. And um, but breakfast, maybe dinner, can that be eaten at home? Again, also let, allowing yourself to enjoy going out to restaurants when possible. I know that there was a huge uptick and it's still a trend of ordering in from restaurants. And of course, this was hard, right? Because we wanted to support the restaurants we loved. We wanted to support the people who owned these restaurants. So many of them went out of business and we you know, did our share. But to be honest, we ate mostly at home from food that I cooked because I just prefer that. And again, this is someone who grew up eating loads of meat, dairy, and eggs and highly processed foods. When you get those things out of your palate and out of your diet, you really do crave whole plant foods more. And that's just how I eat now, just because that's what I prefer. So eating at home, it's going to just cost a lot less and it's going to be a lot healthier. Another way to save money when eating healthfully is to buy in bulk. And that by that, I mean going to the bulk section of a grocery store, or if you have a bulk you know, store near you, we have a wonderful bulk store called The Food Mill. It's been around since the 1920s here in Oakland, and it's in the Fruitvale on MacArthur Avenue, and it's wonderful. And you I'm just really grateful for it. And there are lots of stores. We have a local, our little Lakeshore Produce down on Lakeshore where I, that I can walk to. They have bins. And these are just locally owned mom and pop shops. These are not fancy stores. Frankly, I've been going to those longer than I've been going to any kind of, like I haven't even, I don't even shop at Whole Foods. I, it doesn't serve me anymore, mostly because of the plastic and the packaging. Uh, it just doesn't serve me because they're not there to, they're not they don't have the same mission let's say as the food mill it's not to say that you can't go there trader joe's i don't even go to anymore because of all of the packaging and they don't have bulk bins but look around to some neighborhood stores you might be surprised and find bins in stores you never went into before so if you can buy those the dried beans and the dried lentils and the you know grains and the pastas and and the and the flour uh, oatmeal oats that kind of thing from the bulk bins you're going to be able to choose how much you want you're going to pay for the weight of the food rather than paying for the brand name or packaging so it's not only less expensive it's also more earth friendly because you're bringing your own containers you can bring your own bags etc and uh, and you're paying a lot less okay so incorporating that into your habits will be a positive thing and then of course cooking from scratch it's something that i really relish didn't grow up cooking from scratch, but it's something I love to do now. It is so much less expensive. It is so much less expensive than buying pre-made convenience foods. Doesn't mean you can't ever have them, but make the foundation of the foods you make from scratch. Now, I might go to the extreme. You might be like, I'm not going to make my own tofu. You don't have to. <laughs> I'm going to make my own tofu, and I'm not rigid. There are things that I buy. We still buy aioli, uh, David sometimes wants to buy cheese, and we do buy butter. Miyoko's butter is actually in, a con in the packaging is such that I can compost the the packaging. The point is, this is all about finding a balance that works for you. In terms of ordering in, you can certainly do that as well. We order pizza every single Friday. It's our Friday night tradition from our local, our favorite local pizza place, uh, Bare Knuckle Pizza here in Oakland absolutely love it. So it's not that you can't ever do this, but when you switch it around and make the foundation food from scratch, and I'm going to be really honest, folks, I know that there is a narrative also that says, well, I don't have time. You know, I work two jobs. I'm too busy. I'm too tired when I get home. There are so many ways to, you know, I would argue that it takes you as long to put dried beans in a pot as it takes for you to put a frozen dinner into the oven, okay? You're not standing there watching the frozen dinner cook at the oven, just like you're not standing there watching the beans cook on the stove or in the pressure cooker, whatever, right? however you cook the beans. You're walking away and doing whatever else you want and the beans are cooking and the or the or the you know the processed food is is cooking right so I, 
you know, I, I understand that time constraints are a thing for some people. I just think we have to be honest with ourselves about what that really looks like and when we're able to spend a little bit more time versus money because of, again, the benefits and the costs, right? We have to weigh that all the time. So, you know, another example of pre-made convenience foods are like baking. Okay, I'm going to tell you right now. I grew up on those mixes, those pre-mixes where you would just, you know, get the box and there are vegan ones now where you just get the box and there's like it's, it's already pre-mixed, whether it's a brownie or biscuits or cake or what have you. And then you just add oil or you add plant-based milk or you just add whatever. <laughs> the amount of money you're spending on basically the packaging is astronomical compared to just having the whole flour. I mean, like making hot cocoa, for instance, and I've been doing lots of reels on Instagram, by the way, of just really basic, simple foods. And a lot of these things are these homemade foods like hot cocoa. Hot cocoa is sugar and cocoa powder and some little salt and some vanilla extract. You have all of that in your cupboard, I would assume. You can make that in no time at all, and it costs pennies, right? So if you're looking to save some money, Buying prepackaged like baked um, mixes are um, they're just they're unnecessary expenses. When you parse out the ingredients for any recipes for baked goods in any of my books, you will see that it costs like literally a couple of dollars to make them from scratch versus buying the packaged versions. So when you look at like my drop biscuits and the joy of vegan baking, it costs a dollar fifteen to make twelve biscuits. So a little more than 10 cents a biscuit. My chocolate cake recipe, also the joy of vegan baking, depending on the kind of cocoa you use. And of course, the cost is going to vary depending on what kind of ingredients you buy. Um, but the cost of the entire cake uh, is about $2.75 for less expensive cocoa, $3.46 for fair trade. Less than any cake mix you're going to buy in the store and certainly less than a finished cake made by a bakery. Does that mean you should never buy a bakery cake to support a vegan bakery or a vegan baker? No. But I'm saying as far as the foundation, these are the kinds of things I'm talking about, right? I mean, honestly, if you could make one change, I would say I would say beans. And, you know, canned beans, they're, they're fine, like nutrition-wise, and they're convenient. And it's okay to have some in your cupboard for just like, hey, I want some beans. But because I also talk about planning things in advance and just kind of knowing what you're going to have for dinner at breakfast time, you'll like make the beans in advance or you'll just, you know, throw the beans in the pressure cooker, right? So I do encourage you to do that. That doesn't even take up more time. So don't give me that. That doesn't take more time to think about what you're going to have for dinner. And so then you just do something uh, very quick that's going to actually serve you at, at dinner time and it's going to, you're just thinking ahead all the time. So, you know, I mentioned just putting beans on the stove. You're not sit, standing there watching them cook. Slow cookers are a great example if you don't have a pressure cooker, although pressure cooker totally changed my life, especially when it came to beans, because I just throw them in the pressure cooker and, you know, half hour later they're done and I don't even soak them. And so absolutely worth it. I have my favorite recommendations on my website. You can just go there and use one of the links to see the ones that I recommend. And to be honest, just flavor-wise, there's nothing better. There's just nothing better than beans made from scratch. Uh, but of course, cost-wise, they're also superior. So you don't have to do this every time, but incorporating some of these strategies will make a huge difference in terms of cost, right? When it comes to the costs we pay, I mentioned health, but you know, there's also something to be said for the nutritional bang for your buck, right? So uh, I, I've used the analogy in the past about putting high quality fluids in our cars for them to run well. This is becoming a, an anachronistic analogy because we're moving toward electric cars and, and so you don't put gasoline in, but you get the idea. When we put in high quality fluids for our car, our, our car to run well, it runs well, we need the same high quality fuel for our own bodies to run well. If we fill our car or bodies with junk, they may still run, but not optimally. So optimal health should be our goal. We want to get the best caloric bang for our buck, right? Eating enough food to have the energy to function well, but I think we also want to get the most nutritional bang for our buck so that we're getting the most nutrients for those calories. Physiologically, we need calories for energy, but we also need other nutrients as well. And so when we're eating a lot of highly processed foods, we're eating those 
empty calories. So we're getting filled up, but we're not getting the nutrients we need to function well. It's like filling up a gas tank with water. The tank might be full, but it's not filled with a substance that enables it to run and soon it will break down. So everyone's going to have a different idea of what those junk, what the junk is going into your body. I'm going to tell you my opinion. Well, I've already told you my opinion. You know, eating whole foods for the most part, you know, when we're having minimally processed foods, you know, and sometimes highly processed foods, the main thing is that they're going to be packaged, they're going to cost more, and they're not going to be whole foods. But there is nothing, I don't have a problem with them in and of themselves, other than the fact that they're just not going to be as nutrient dense. They're just going to have empty calories in some cases, and they're not going to have as many vitamins and minerals and antioxidants and phytochemicals and fiber, etc. But that doesn't mean it's an all or nothing game, right? So everyone's going to have a different opinion about that. Find your own in terms of what makes sense to you. And I do believe that when you eat more whole foods, you're just going to crave more. Like, I just don't believe me. Just do it. <laughs> like, just do it. Um, that's the fun of kind of taking 30 days to, you know, to try different food or to eliminate other things to, you know, take the vegan challenge, those kinds of like, you get to see your habits and you get to see how you feel. So th- that's what I recommend. You know, obviously, the most nutrient dense foods are those foods that are the greenest, you know, uh, the, the kales and the Brussels sprouts and the broccoli and all of the things that people need to eat more of, of course, all the other vegetables as well. And I don't think it's realistic to think that everyone is going to go out and choose kale over burgers, even delicious plant-based burgers for every meal. But I but I will tell you that you will feel more empowered the more you experiment on yourself and see how you feel and what you begin to crave and what you crave less of and and certainly how much you um, how much money you're saving you're going to see a real difference. And then finally, when it comes to saving money, a lot of it has to do with certainly where we shop and how we shop. So there's a lot of evidence that, uh, that you know, making a list and sticking to it is vital to saving money when you go to the grocery store, uh, that when you buy um, items on the lower shelves, they tend to be less flashy because the, uh, the ones that pay to be at eye level or higher, uh, they tend to be more expensive. Um, eat before you shop. I know it sounds it's like an old wives tale, but it's true. If you like actually are full when you go shopping, you're less inclined to go and kind of get a lot of junk. Um, try if you can to go to some local little mom and pop places and see if they have um, bulk bins. If you're able to go to a farm stand or a farmer's market near you, you're going to really be um, experiencing the maximum amount of flavor and freshness. Uh, you're supporting local farms. I I am very grateful that we can go to a farmer's market, certainly around the year because we live in California, but even by you, it might be the spring and the summer and the fall. So check out what's near you. And I want to say in terms of cost, please don't conflate plant-based, vegan, and organic, they're very different concepts, right? There are times to choose organic and there are times to to choose conventional and you might only ever choose conventional, that's fine. Uh, There's a lot to say around organic foods, this is not the time for it, Um, but you know, again, we tend to think that we're paying more for organic, um, but we're really often paying the true cost versus conventionally grown produce, but not all conventionally grown produce is highly sprayed with pesticides. So if that's something you're concerned about, you know, go find out what the Dirty Dozen is, right? Or the, the Clean 15, as has been called by by different organizations. So, um, so that you can make the decision and say, you know, I can't, I'm not going to get, you know, organic blueberries, but I am going to get organic strawberries because they tend to be sprayed more. You can make that decision, but at least don't conflate organic and and plant-based. Um, and then finally, Finally, um, when you're considering going to the grocery store, I really encourage you to have have fun. Play this game. When you say there's nothing to eat at home, I have to go to the grocery store, I challenge you to stretch that out three more days three more days and take a hard look at what is in your freezer, your refrigerator, your cupboards. Often we shove things in the back of the refrigerator, we shove things in the freezer, and then, you know, we have a knee-jerk reaction and say, oh, there's nothing to eat 
because it's just sitting in the freezer. But like, look in the freezer. And then eventually what's going to happen is you're going to say, oh, I got freezer burn. I'm going to throw it out. Or, oh, it went bad in the, in the refrigerator. So I'm going to throw it out. Don't do that. <laughs> so go look at what you have. You probably have pasta. You might have pasta sauce. You might have some rice, some beans you can make. I bet you could stretch out going to the grocery store an entire week. I'm going to challenge you to do that, right? So just get creative. Take a look at what you have and see where you can stretch out your visit. You're going to save a little bit of money. And perhaps you're going to really enjoy something you come up with. I think you're going to enjoy the creative aspects of it. So we're going to talk about a lot more related to this. And of course, there's so much to say. I mean, there are larger socioeconomic, political, cultural issues that dictate our personal choices. But scapegoating veganism, which is simply a means by which we live more healthfully and compassionately, is simply misplaced. It's unfortunate and it's unhelpful because turning away from veganism in particular or the plant kingdom in general doesn't solve anything at all. In fact, the more we embrace the meat, dairy, and eggs, the meat, dairy, and egg industries are, are pushing, the more problems we create, the more we perpetuate, right, in terms of our health, in terms of the environment, in terms of poverty and hunger. You know, you've heard before uh, that the process of using grain to produce meat is incredibly wasteful, right? We use more um, land to create meat, animal-based meat, um, you know, per acre than if we were eating a diet of grains and vegetables and beans. We could support 20 times more people than a diet of meat. And as it stands now, about half the harvested acreage in the United States is used to feed animals. So, you know, when we're talking about poverty and hunger, excuse me, that's Michko scratching her little scratching post. Rude. When we're talking about hunger and poverty, <laughs> um, scapegoating veganism doesn't make any sense. We need to look at where the real culprits are. Eating a plant-based diet is not the problem. It's the solution. So in this episode, we talked about how costs are not just calculated in terms of dollars and cents when it comes to how we eat and what we eat. There are high costs um, to cheap meat. And I hope I've aptly demonstrated that while you don't have to eat only whole foods and never eat out to have a lower food bill, centering your diet around health-promoting plant foods is less expensive when it comes to the money you shell out. In the next episode, I'm going to talk about the quintessential cheap food, namely fast food, and whether we vegans or anyone at all should support the efforts fast food chains are making to increase healthful vegan options at their establishments. Until then, for the animals, this is Colleen Patrick-Goudreau. Thanks for listening. Mm -hmm.